truly amazed by our God. The song says, how deep, how wide, yes. how great yeah. is your love for me. I know it's only a few of us in here. I'm going to just take a minute to just, just continue the praise and the worship. Father, we just lift up your name, oh God. Lord, we bless your name today. Lord, how deep thank you, is your love for us, oh God? How wide is your love for us? How great is your love for us, oh God? Father, we just thank you for loving us, oh God. Father, we thank you for loving us in spite of us. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, thank you, Jesus. By your love for us, oh God. Father, when I look at myself, when I look at my actions, my thoughts, my demeanor sometimes, my motivations, oh God, who should love me? But God, you love me, oh God. Father, we just thank you today. Thank you, God, for loving us in spite of us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, even for loving us because of us, oh God, because of our sin, because of our failure to love us, oh God, because we need you. Love us, oh God, because we call your name. You love us, oh God, because you decided to. You love us, oh God. Father, we just thank you for your love today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. We lift up your name on high. You are worthy to be praised. You are worthy to be adored, oh God. You are worthy to be honored. You are worthy to be glorified, oh God. So we just bless your name today. Father, receive our praise in this place, oh God. Before you Forward, oh God, let us give our all to you in worship, oh God. Touch our hearts that we might worship you today, oh God. Lord, give us a word today that will change our lives, oh God. Give us a word that will strengthen us today, Lord. Speak into our lives today, oh God. Cause us to live out our faith in a greater way. Cause us to grow closer to you, oh God. Father, strengthen me now. Lord, I am weak. I can do nothing apart from you, oh God, but in you, in you, all things are possible. Lord, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for this moment to worship you, to commune with you. Let us not take this moment for granted, oh God. Father, let us be caught up not in a program, but in your Holy Spirit. Let us receive the very things you have for us today, oh God. Healing, encouragement, even, even conviction, oh God. Give us the very thing we need today. We'll be forever mindful. Give you all the praise, honor, and glory you deserve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, good morning. We were having a little, I want to say technical difficulties, but I think we'll have to call them Jamal difficulties. So we will just go ahead and move. Um, we're going to be talking again about discipleship. I know a couple weeks ago, I kind of touched on it with Luke 9 23, with us denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following him. Yes. And it's been on it's been on Pastor Shane's heart, as well as my heart, as well as Dina and Diana's heart, to grow us in discipleship. God is calling us to grow in discipleship. So we're just going to start continue to talk about living like a disciple. Oh, there it is. I'll tell y'all, Roy is outstanding. I gave him half. I gave him half a PowerPoint, and he took it in minutes and put it together. Amen. I, I, I thank God for Roy. Amen. Amen. We live in a microwave society. We live in a microwave society. Amen. Amen. In our world, I heard. A, I heard. I'm, I'm, I think y'all probably know. I'm into science and all of that. Into apologetics. I like to study that kind of stuff because I like to. I'm a debater. I'm an arguer. So. I like to know what the other, I like to know what the opponent, where they're coming from. So I study a lot of that. Amen. The scientists now, especially in, techno, in technology, they say never in history, or there's never been a time in history where technology has moved so fast. And there will never be another time in history where technology will move so slow. The world is moving faster, seems every day. Time is moving faster. Our mindsets are moving faster now. The microwave society, we want everything. I won't say we want everything. We get things right now. Things that we used to have to wait on, now we don't have to wait on. We used to have to save up for things, now we can borrow for everything. Now we, we used to have to, it used to have to be a goal to get that, to get the big car. 
Now we can get a 10 year loan and get the big car, microwave society. The things we want now are at our fingertips, amen? amen. Everything is instant. Everything is instant. At work, I was looking at, I was looking at some of the snacks that we have at work and I'm, I've been kind of paying attention to my health a little bit more so I started to look at packages and just see all the stuff in our packages. They got instant oatmeal, instant grits, instant rice, instant you name it. And in our society, we have all these instant things where we, we say just add water. Oatmeal, just add water. Make some grits, just add water. Discipleship, Christianity, just add water. Baptism, wow. right? We argue those points. Whose name are we baptizing? Just add water. Ah, come on. All right, the things we want, just add water. But disciple making is a little more, it's going a little for, further than baptism. It's going a little further than just add water, Christianity. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 14 today in verses 25 through 35. I'm not going to read it just yet. But I'm going to give you just some history of where they are in Luke. Luke, at this point, Jesus is building up a crowd. He's got a bunch of followers. And I don't know if you know anything about Jesus. He's, he, was, he wasn't one to have to relish in big crowds. Even though they fed 5,000, even though they fed 4,000, even though many followed him, he wasn't one to have big crowds who proclaimed his name. And so he would sometimes intentionally speak to those crowds and kind of give them a hard word. So this is getting ready to happen. He's ready to give them a hard word. And some of that crowd, based on what he tells them, is going to get a little smaller. And so I just want to look at a couple things before we get into it, but there's a story of the chicken and the pig. Anybody ever heard the story of the chicken and the pig? Okay, so the chicken and the pig got together and said, well, we need to feed. People are hungry. We need to feed them. So let's do a breakfast. Well, what do we normally, what's good for breakfast? Usually bacon and eggs. All right, so the chicken said, all right, we'll have some bacon and eggs. The pig said, cool, we'll have bacon and eggs. The pig thought about it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, chicken. All you gotta do, all you gotta do is contribute. But I have to give of myself for this breakfast. So that chicken and that pig, that analogy is used sometimes, sometimes in sports and in business, just talking about commitment. See, the chicken, we don't want to be the, the chicken Christian, the chicken believer. The chicken just have to give an offering. Uh -huh. The chicken just come and drop it at the altar, go by his way, everybody gets to eat and they're happy. But the pig has to be cut. The pig has to be hurt harmed, even killed, and the pig is, has, has to give his life for somebody else to eat. So that's the Christianity we want. We want to get to that that type of discipleship, where we're willing to give of ourselves to benefit those who follow us, or those who might come after us, or those who we know need Jesus, like we say. And so we want to be the pig. Discipling takes time, effort, and total commitment. You can't have it in the microwave world. I gotta work. I gotta work at it. So let's go ahead and get into the scripture. You can uh do you have the entire scripture up? Alright, so back up one more time. Back up one more. Before we do, let's look at these levels of commitment. And just as I read them, just think about where you fit. Or think about where we fit collectively. The crowd. The crowd level of commitment. The crowd says, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. See, the crowd in Luke were those, were those thousands. They were following him. He told a good message. People were getting healed. They were excited. It felt good. It made them feel better. Their family felt better. They were, they were flocking to Jesus. That's the crowd. And see, this, this is where many people fit in our society now, especially in the black community, the crowd. People believe, say, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus, but not necessarily in that way but also others. And so that's that crowd. They're interested. They're interested. They're following. But they're at that low level commitment. The next level of commitment is the congregation. So going from the crowd to the congregation. Now I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. I prayed that prayer. Now what do I have to do? I got to go to church. So I'm going to go to church, the crowd. We've all been at this point. I'll just say that. I know I've been at this point many times. The congregation. We get mad and we leave. Mm -hmm. ah, yeah. 
Somebody look at us the wrong way, we out. Done with them. The preachers say something we don't like, we out. And I know me, I just speak for myself. They ask too much money, I'm out. Right? They pour, preacher pull up in the preacher pull up in the Bentley, I'm gone. Especially if it's in the hood. The congregation, I've been there. I, I, can, I can say that for myself. Me and my, my wife and I have been there. We've been the congregation and we got mad and we rolled out. We're still believers. That's what many of us fit in the congregation. We'll go a little further to our commitment level, then we become the church. Now we join the church. Now we're not just going anymore. We're not just showing up and sitting down. We join the church. We join the ministry. We get involved. We start singing. We start praising. We join different committees, different ministries. We start serving. We start telling people about our church, the church. This is a high-level committee. We still might waver, but we want to get to this point where we become the committee. The committee. This is where the disciples are. This is what Jesus in this chapter, in this text, this is who Jesus was, was, was aiming for. He was aiming to get the fluff, to cut out the fluff, to cut out the dead weight, to cut out the people that's just messing around. And we're going to see who's really about that. Was, they used to say, I don't know if they say it now, teenagers, about their life. Do they still say that? About their life? I don't know. Usually when stuff gets to us, it's old anyway, so I'm okay with that. But they're not, they're, not, they're not about that. And so Jesus wants to talk to the committed. He wants the committed believers. The 80-20. We've heard of the 80-20 rule. The 20% usually do the work in most organizations. They do 80% of the work. It's the same way in the church. I found in my years in ministry, it's probably closer to the 10% do 95% of the work. But that's that committed. I want to be in that number. I want to be in that committed, that disciple, that 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 committed believer that's not just going to church, that's not just playing a role, that's not just talking about my church or my religion, but now I'm living out my faith and I'm following Christ. So let's go ahead into Luke chapter 26. Now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes after me and does not hate his own father and mother, and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he builds, when he wants to build a tower, does not first download and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete? Next one. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Mm -hmm. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Yeah. Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Therefore, salt is good, but even if salt has become tasteless, what will, with what will it have seasoned? It's useless, for either the soil or the manure pile is thrown out. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Now we're going to go through that. And I got five quick things that a disciple looks like, because you want to live like a disciple. The first one is a disciple puts God first. A disciple puts God first. Now, it was funny when I, I had a different I had a different point there, but it just ended up with put God first. And God was kind of speaking to me with that saying that, I, that, that we always say, keep God first. Keep God first. Well, what does that look like? Jesus, in verse 26, says, if you come to me and don't hate your father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters and hate your own life, you can go ahead on. So why would Jesus say that? Jesus normally talks about love. Mm -hmm. he, he preaches a, love, a message of, of love in the world. His message was to the Gentiles. We, God loves you too. God wants, God wants to save you too. So now why is he turning around and talking about hate? Well, he's using something that I, that I love, and it's called hyperbole. And hyperbole is purposeful exaggeration. You know, when we're telling the story, and we exaggerate a little bit, Anybody ever done that before? Mm -hmm. 
Right? I told him 99, I told him a million times. Mm -hmm. And he still ain't listening. Right? You didn't tell him a million times, but you're just stressing the importance. It's not a lie, but just elaborating or making the story a little bit better. This is what Jesus was doing. He's saying, hate your wife. He's not saying hate them, I hate you. He's talking about love less. In the Greek, that word for hate means to love less or prefer above. So prefer Christ above your wife. Prefer Christ above your mother and father. Prefer Christ above your children and your brothers and sisters. Prefer Christ above. So we have to put God first in our lives as a disciple. We can go ahead to the next one. A disciple follows through. Carries their cross. There we go. A disciple carries their cross. We're looking at verse 27. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now I know we talked about carrying our cross before in Luke 9 23. But what is that cross? I just want to kind of look at this cross. See, the cross in our society has become has become a symbol of pride. We wear our cross and say I'm a Christian. People buy crosses and they put diamonds in them. They make them out of gold. They make them out of black. Rappers get the biggest, the biggest cross that they can find and spend the most money on. We wear them in our jewelry. We wear them on cheap jewelry, expensive jewelry. We get tattoos with a cross on it with somebody that we love. And, and I'm, when I say we, I'm just talking about we, the human race, all of us, not specifically. But this cross, we've made this cross this, this, this beautiful thing. But the cross in Jesus' time wasn't a symbol of love. The cross or the crucifix was a symbol of death. The cross was a symbol of like, similar to being on death row. They're on that cross because they have been sentenced to die. And this is how they're going to be killed. And so we carry our cross. Not a cross as a symbol of pride. I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. But the cross is crucifying our sinful nature. So we need to put our sin on death row. But, and, and many of us, many of us do. I know I do. I put my sin on death row. I sentenced that sin to death. They've been charged. I'm the judge. I'm the jury. I'm the executioner saying you're going to die. And then I put sin on death row. And then I sit there and I think about it. I say, you know what? You don't need to die. Mm. Come on now. You can come. You can live. Wow. You can come back. Ah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, good. Come on. Matter of fact, come on back in the house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're good. Yeah. We can live. We can we can live together, uh -huh. right? You, we can be you and God. Yes. The, Lord, the Lord know my heart. Says, come on, come on. You're good. Right. See, we don't we don't know. And I'm, so I'm talking about me. I'm just talking about me. I don't always crucify my sinful nature. I put that thing on that. I put that thing down there, and I say, I, and I, in the name of Jesus, saying I rebuke you. Uh -huh. And then in the name of me and my flesh, I don't say that, but that's what I do. In the name of me, I pick it back up. Come on. I put it back inside me and I live it back out. And so I'm not carrying my cross. But to carry our cross is a process of crucifying our sin. And it's a, it's a work in progress. None of us are perfect. But we put that sin on death row. And we do everything in our power to keep it there. We do everything in our power to see that sin executed. We live that. We try to walk that walk. We, we, we have people hold us accountable in those secret areas, in those areas where we don't talk about. We have somebody call us and say, well, man, oh, uh, well, man what's going on? Uh -huh. Sister, what's going on? Mm -hmm. Right? Have somebody keep us in check, crucifying our sinful nature. Because our sinful nature wants to live. Yeah. It wants to flourish. Yeah. Just, like our, just like our spirit does. Yeah. But we don't crucify that flesh, it's coming back. It's going to live uh -huh. in our house. It's going to live in our children. We're going to pass it down yep, to yep. generate from generation to generation. Yep. I don't want to pass down sin. Uh -huh. I want to pass down. I want to pass down my faith. I want yes, to pass down yes. a, a life in Christ. I want to pass down yeah. discipleship. Yeah. We have to carry our cross. Stop taking our sin off death row. Mm -hmm. The third one. A disciple follows through. Wow. Follows through. This is hitting me hard. Luke 28. Uh, 14, 28 through 30. Which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man 
began to build and was not able to finish. If somebody comes into my basement right now at this very moment, I'm not talking conceptually, I'm not talking about an idea, I'm talking about a reality. If somebody comes into my basement right now, they're gonna see a spool of electrical wire that I bought a couple months ago because I was gonna run some wire and I didn't follow through. I didn't follow through. So somebody's gonna walk through there and they're gonna laugh at me. They might not talk, but they see that I started something and didn't finish it. How many of us have things in our lives that we started and didn't finish? How many of us have ideas that God has given us and we started and we didn't finish? Why didn't we finish? Well, I, I ain't into that no more. I'm going a different direction. Um, that ain't my thing no more. I gotta take care of my business. I gotta take care of my family. I gotta work. I gotta so and so. I gotta fill in the blank. I have to not follow through. That's what our flesh says. Yes. But a disciple follows through. A disciple follows through. There's a church. And I, I drive by this church pretty often on my way home from work on Woodward. And it's on Woodward in one of those mile roads. And there was a, a church that decided, a team decided they were going to build a new building. And so they started to buy this land. You know, we can have a side conversation if you want about the ins and outs of that because I'm also in the fire department. So that's another conversation. But they decided to buy this land. They bought this huge block of land and they started building this, this building, this new facility. Because, you know, we want to be on the mountaintop. Or, I don't know, I wasn't in there in the circle. But they started building this building. They put a fence up around the building. They, got, they put a security person in the, in the building. For some reason, the building didn't get finished. And it's been like this for years. And I drive by that, and now the building, which was supposed to be a pillar in the neighborhood, in the community, now the building looks just like any other, in, any other abandoned building. Wow. They started, and they didn't finish. So now, every time I drive by that church, that's what I think. This man began to build and was not able to finish. This church began to build and was not able to finish. That is not the mark of a disciple. That's the mark of us not following through. We have great ideas. And it's good intentions. So, so many times we have good intentions and we mean well. And we, we have a good idea and we're going to do it. And then circumstances happen and it falls off. Amen? How about our diets? Right? Some of us had a New Year's resolution. But we didn't call it that. I didn't call it that. I'm just going to do differently. We don't call it a diet. I'm just going to change my eating habits. So we changed our eating habits. And then by January 17th, somebody made a cake. Somebody had a birthday. Our kids had a birthday. Somebody had some cupcakes. Somebody had some candy. I'm not going to eat meat. Now somebody eating a sandwich. It looked good. That burger looked good. We don't follow through. We don't follow through. See, a disciple, a disciple has gotten themselves to the point where our external circumstances yeah. is not, are not easily affecting what they have decided internally. Right. If God has given me an idea and I'm a, a disciple, if he's given me a goal and I'm a disciple, then I'm, I have to be driven by the goal that he's given me. I have to be driven by the power that he's given me, by the Holy Spirit inside me. I can't be driven or affected by outward circumstances. Right. I'm driven to my goal. That's where a disciple is. I think of Jesus telling the disciples, get on the boat and meet me on the other side. And when they got on the boat, it started storming. But he told them to go to the other side. But even as we call them disciples, they still got scared. They still got, they still got affected, infected by external circumstances. Even when he was on the boat with them in a different time. And he went to sleep. They still got scared. They still got affected by external circumstances. They start calling out and, 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 and hollering at Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. That's where we get. It's a, like I said, it's a work in progress. But a disciple follows through. A disciple follows through. Let's look at the next one. A disciple surrenders to the king. A disciple surrenders to the king. Luke. Same chapter, verse 31. What king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, when I first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming with 20,000 against our lives? Or else, while the other is still far away, he'll send a delegation to ask for terms of peace. The disciple surrenders to the king because the disciple knows when to surrender. Mm -hmm. The disciple knows when he's in the presence of a king. Mm -hmm. The disciple knows 
when he just can't win and he, and he just got to let it go. So I think of a movie, 300. It's one of my favorite movies. I remember in the beginning of that movie. I'll probably at some later date use the movie 300 to, tell, to illustrate a different point because it's a great movie. Yeah. But in this point here, the, a representative of Artix, or Xerxes, the god, he called himself the god king, the king of kings. That's what he called himself in real life. A representative of Xerxes, as, they, as the Persian Empire was conquering the world, he decided to go to Sparta. And he encountered a king, another king, named Leonidas. He's a king. And he said, we will give you all of this. This is what Xerxes said. I'm a good king. I'm a good God king. But I'm the king of kings. He said, we will give you everything you need. We'll take care of your land. We'll take care of your people. Everybody will eat good. Everybody will be comfortable. All you have to do is bow down. And of course, in the great triumphant moment in 300, this is Sparta! And kicked them down the, he kicked them down into a hole. Killed them. Right? That's where we are sometimes with our surrender with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jesus says, I am going to give you everything you need. Everything that you need in your life will be provided. Everything, every, every place that you want to go, I'll do it. He says, seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and everything should be added unto you. Everything. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is seek me. And sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes we say, get out of here. Mm -hmm. We might not say it like that, but we do this. Wow. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's God. Wow. Uh, but God gave me power, so I'm good. Mm -hmm. So we don't always surrender. King knows when to surrender. There's a story of a lifeguard. The lifeguard was out on the beach and he saw a man drowning. And there was a, a crowd of people. They also saw the man drowning. The lifeguard went out into the water, uh, knee deep, and he watched the man drown. And the crowd was wondering, well, man, if you're a lifeguard, how come you're not doing anything? They're wondering, he's waiting. He moves on a little further into the water, the waves start raging, this man, is going to drown. He's going to die if nobody does anything. The lifeguard just watches. So the man keeps watching. He keeps watching. The man, the, the guy keeps drowning. Finally, he's he finally he's now unconscious. He can't fight the waves anymore. Now suddenly, now the lifeguard get hard. So he goes out and he rescues the man, pulls him in. They do CPR. That man, man, he saved his life. The guy's breathing. He coughs up the water. And instead of Instead of heralding him as a hero, the people are accosting him. They're getting on his head now. Mm -hmm. How come you didn't go out there? How, what, what, what took you so long? What's wrong? What took you so long? The man said, well, that man out there was a lot bigger than me. Mm -hmm. And I realized if I tried to go out there and rescue him while he was fighting that water, wow. he was going to fight me, and we both were going to drown. Wow. So I had to wait until he surrendered, then I could rescue him. And so many of us spend our lives as that drowning, as that drowning man. Yeah. Jesus is not going to force his way into our lives. He's not going to force his way into making us a disciple. We have to decide to surrender. See, we'll be out in that water, and we're calling on God, and the waves are getting bigger, and we're getting mad at God, and the waves are getting bigger, and we're getting angry at our family, and the waves are getting bigger, and we say we're on our own, and the waves are getting bigger, and nobody's on my team. The waves are getting bigger, nobody cares about me. The waves are getting bigger, nobody is looking out for me. The waves are getting bigger, I'm all by myself. I don't have God, I don't need God, I don't want God, I'm going to die. And God is just waiting. He's just waiting for us to turn into a disciple and to surrender. Amen. To surrender. Amen. See, once we surrender, then he's coming out into that water. Mm -hmm. Once we surrender, once we say, Lord, I need you, and we mean it, and we let, and we let go of our fight, yeah. then he's going to do it. Amen. Excuse me. Once we surrender, then he's going to then he's going to bring that change. Then he's going to bring that victory. Once we surrender, he's going to bring that thing that he's yeah. calling us to. Yeah. Once we surrender, as long as we keep fighting and keep trying to do it, we're going to keep hitting our head. Yeah. One step forward and three steps back. Yeah. That's our lives. Amen. But if we can get to that point where we surrender Amen. to God and just let him do it. Amen. Just let him do it. Surrender to the king. Amen. See, this king here Jesus is talking about, he knows what he be. Uh -huh. He's like, look, I got 10,000. My man got 20,000. Let me go talk to him. And see if we can work out a deal of surrender. I surrender. 
Now don't kill us. Now help me. Save me. Right? That's the kind of king that we should be. Because we are kings and queens. But he is the king of kings. We need to be able to surrender to him. The last one. A disciple is the salt of the earth. Therefore, salt is good. Verse 34. But if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It's useless for either the soil or the manure pile is thrown out. The salt of the world. See, our world is rotten. Yes. And we believers, we talk about this all the time, and it's true. The world is rotten. The world is, as we say, going to hell in a handbasket, right? Or gasoline draws on. Whatever, whatever figure of speech you want, to, you want to come up with. That's what's happening to the world. Right? Right is wrong. Right is the new wrong. Holy is the new unholy. Yeah. Unwilling to compromise for your faith is the new hatred. Right. And so, this is our world. Uh -huh. And we look back at these times where Jesus is talking about salt. In this, in this region, in the world, in this time, they got their salt from the Dead Sea. And so, the salt that came from the Dead Sea was different from salt that came from the mine. Mm. Salt that comes from the mine, salt mines, is pure salt. If we get a crystal of salt from a salt mine and it's pure salt, 10,000 years from now, it will still be a pure salt crystal. But the salt from the Dead Sea, it was at the bottom of the sea. And when the water would, when the water would evaporate and wash away, it would sometimes wash away the, it would sometimes wash away the sodium chloride, the salt. And so they would have, they would have crystals that looked like salt, but they were sand. Crystals that looked like salt, but they were rocks. And so what would happen if they got that, if they got that impure salt, because they might, they might still have a salty taste, but it wasn't pure salt. If they got that impure salt because they didn't have refrigeration, they weren't able to keep their meat from rotting. And they wouldn't find out until the meat was rotten. So they would, they would put it in there, you know, that's how bacon is made, one of the ways they cure it with salt. Try to cure bacon with some impure salt, and it's going to spoil it. And so that's what would happen with the meat in those times. If they had that impure salt, that meat would go rotten. And they wouldn't know it until after. You see, many of us, as far as being a disciple, as far as being a believer, as far as winning the world, living our faith before the world, many of us live like dead sea salt. Mm -hmm. Our lives are filled with impurities. Mm -hmm. Our thoughts are filled with impurities. And not that we get impure thoughts. We, we, we have sin. That's, a, that, that's normal. But it's what we do with those thoughts. It's what we do with those temptations. It's what we do with those desires. So we're going to tell those thoughts, get out of my house. We tell that thought, come on. What you need? Have a seat. Possibly you want to watch some TV? Thought? Temptation? You want something to eat? You want something to drink? Would you like bottled water? Or would you like filtered water? Well, I prefer, I prefer tap water. You got it. You want some ice? Uh -huh. right. I don't have any, but I'll go buy something for you, thought. Right. That's what we do with that thought. Yeah. Then we sit down in front of that thought and we say, thought, now, tell me what you're thinking. Uh -huh. Tell me all about yourself, thought. Uh -huh. Tell me all about what you're thinking about, thought. Uh -huh. I want to think what you think. Yeah. Wow. That's what we do with that thought. Wow. And that's how we become dead sea salt. See, so now when the thought is washed away, when the action is washed away, we did it, we messed up. Oh, Lord Jesus, save me. Oh, Lord Jesus, help me. Yep. Now we're in pure salt. Now when you try to tell somebody something, now, but I saw you doing so-and-so. Yeah. But I saw, I heard you saying so-and-so. Yeah. Now we're not keeping this world from rotting. Now the community around us is continuing to get worse. Nobody's, nobody's life is improving through contact with us. Uh -huh. wow. See, as a disciple, people's lives should be impacted. I'm not going to go super churchy and say people shouldn't cuss around us or people should act differently around us. Mm -hmm. But their life should be intrinsically in, in, improved yeah. through contact with us. Yeah. Their thoughts, even if it's just, even if it's just something that they just piques their interest. Maybe I should think a little differently. Yeah. Maybe I should, maybe I should try that. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Yeah. Their lives should be should be impacted through contact with us. Yes. We are the salt of the earth, and so many of us, like I said, we're the Dead Sea salt. Mm -hmm. We've lost our impurity, mm -hmm. but but just like when we talked about a disciple following through. See, all those things that we failed on, it's not over. Mm -hmm. and so that's the good news for us yes. as followers of Christ. It's not over. Mm -hmm. We're still here. Mm -hmm. God can still restore us. Mm -hmm. 
we're still here. God can still use us. God can still strengthen us. God can still heal us. God can still forgive us. Yes. God can still use us to save others. Yes. God can restore us to being the salt. Yes. So if we want to live like a disciple, we talked about those different levels of commitment. We want to get to that committed, that 20% that does the 80% of the work. Mm -hmm. As a disciple, we want to put God first. Mm -hmm. We need to carry our cross daily, crucify our sinful nature. As a disciple, we follow through. Pick those things back up that we put down, mm -hmm. that we know we're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. As a disciple, we surrender to the king. We know who we're beating. We know this. We, we, we understand we're just Jesus. It might take a while sometimes, but okay, I hear you, God. I'm going I'm to I'm 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 sit down. And the disciple understands and lives out that salt of the earth. And as a disciple, we know the importance of remaining pure so that we can keep others from going right. Mm -hmm. So we can keep our world from spoiling. Amen. 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 Give God a hand of praise. Okay, so we, are, we have our communion. We're going to go ahead and serve.